Well, good morning, church. It's so good to see every one of you here. Are you excited to be here? Oh, that was kind of weak. And are you excited to be here? Come on, it's Sunday. Why don't you stand with us as we get ready to worship? Amen. Amen. Okay, so our call to worship is from Psalm 63 and... And it says, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life. And my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Right now, can we just lift up our hands to his name? As we pray, Heavenly Father, we, our hearts are humbled, God. to who you are. God, you sit on the throne, but still you showed us your loving kindness, God. And so this morning, we just want to praise you. We want to give you glory, God. We want to give you our worship. And as we do that, Lord, I just pray that you would dwell in the praises of your people, God. And move in our hearts, Lord, and reveal yourself to us, God. Open the eyes of our hearts to you this morning, Lord. To see you for who you are. The great and mighty King. The everlasting God. Amen. Amen. Let's sing to him this morning. Like 
We give him praise this morning, church. Yes, God. Yes, Lord, we give you praise, God. You are the almighty God. You are holy, Lord, and there is no one like you. Your name is 
righteousness covers us now. We thank you for your blood, Jesus, that you gave for us, Lord. And Lord, as we take a moment just to remember that and be thankful, it reminds us that, Lord, we we need you. And Lord, you are for us. And I know, Lord, there, there are many today. We come with needs. You see them. You see the one here today that is possibly feeling very alone. And you want to meet them there in their need for for comfort, for companionship, Lord. We just thank you, God, that when we turn our eyes on you, we can see you and your love and our care, your care for us, Lord. And as we thank you for that peace and we thank you for the strength that you give us when we turn our eyes on you, just like what was said a moment ago and That's where we find our strength. Your Holy Spirit has reminded us of that. But also, Lord, we take time to remember just praying for the peace of Jerusalem and everything they've been going through um, in Israel. And it's not just in Israel. It's we know it's everywhere, but we are instructed in your word to remember to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So, Lord, we don't only only pray for our, our peace. But we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. May souls come to know you. Your people will not be missed. They won't miss out on this opportunity to turn their hearts to you, Lord. And as we're reminded to pray for them, Lord, may our hearts today turn towards you. Help us to hear and truly listen. I know, Lord, you've been showing me it's not just listening, it's it's, it's doing what you say. I mean, it's not just hearing. I mean, to listen to obey. That's how our faith grows. And so, Lord, help us to do that today. We want to be uh, your follower, your student, Jesus. So teach us today by your word, and may we hold closely to that today and this week. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you, God, for what you're going to do, for what you're already doing, Lord. You're a miracle-working God. Help us not to forget that. And you're mighty name, Lord. Mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. He is so good. Well, kids, we got a little change here. You're going to be dismissed through this door here, up front to the side. And there's a reason for it. We're not just changing it up to change it up. So come find your your way to the front and have a blessed time in kids church. They're going to safely go next door this way. Um, So being said with that, we have obviously construction projects going on. That's why it's blocking the hallway. But that's a good news. That's good news. That's exciting. Like there's things happening. Yes. And sometimes it's messy before it gets better. But 
it's okay. We're being flexible here. So parents, I want you to know that we need you to be flexible too. So you will not want to go out the same door they went out. You're like, why not? Just trust me. You're going to go out the main doors and along the sidewalk to go pick them up, to pick your kids up. Yes, you got to pick up your kids. Okay. So don't forget that. Sometimes, you know, you go out and you're like, oh yeah, but you want to go around the sidewalk and that's the safest, um, just, it's the easiest. It's not like that's not safe, but just trust me. You'll enjoy it. Hopefully the sun will be shining by then. It looks like it is. So this is good. All right. So that's, um, I wanted to make sure that was clear for after the service. And then just a few announcements and then um, also wanted to focus on our give back for the month. And so um, just for the announcements, there's two that I'm going to focus on. We have our young adult uh, worship night this Saturday, and that's for our 18 to 30 year olds. Um, It's really when they graduate from high school, although some of you are so close to graduating. So sooner than later, you're going to be joining us in that group as well. But we are meeting this Saturday, 6 o'clock, here at Sumner Family Church. And we are bringing in a guest speaker. um, So you're not going to want to miss that. And we're going to have worship and just an awesome time of gathering together um, young adults. And then also um, for our seniors, that's the 55 and plus that feel really young sometimes. Um, No, seriously, there is something planned for you on the 13th. I announced it last week. And I think you all heard because it's just about full. The sign up is just about full. There's a few more spots um, that, you know, and then just put your, if you're interested, and we probably will start a little bit of a waiting list, but I honestly think it's just people that signed up, they're going to be there because they get to go to Aversano's um, the day before Valentine's Day. So, but two more spots probably left. So sign up in the foyer for that. All right, shifting gears, I wanted to highlight. You might have seen the bottles when you came on, came in. And you're like, what's about the bottles? If you were here last time with us this time of year, you're familiar with this. This is um, in a support uh, to partnering with CareNet. And CareNet is a pregnancy and family services um, nonprofit here. Uh, we're, pro- we're CareNet of Puget Sound, so it's in our area. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit here, take a minute here to share how we can be a part of this and what difference it makes. And I'll explain this a little bit more. But CareNet, again, is a nonprofit organization. And what I love about it is that it envisions a culture where where women and men faced with pregnancy decisions, they're transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is so important. And so they do that. They are empowered to choose life for their unborn children. And Another thing I was even sharing with a few people earlier, they're not just pro-life, they're pro-mom, pro-dad, pro-services to help them. And so this is what we get to partner with. Since 2008, CareNet has put their vision into practice. Now listen to this. This, is, this should in- encourage us, again, since 2008, saving more than 850,000 babies from abortion. And last year alone, the, the Care Network Pregnancy Centers provided clients, catch this, with more than 65 million in free services. So this is important to know that this is what we're partnering with. And today, after the service, we are handing out bottles. You can grab them. They're in the back table out in the foyer. We're going to have a basket that you can just grab one. Somebody said, can I take more than one? I want to make sure everybody at least gets one that wants one. But yeah, we're filling these bottles. And family unit, per family unit. So per family unit, if you have a big family, maybe you do have two because you are you have more change to put in. But we want to make sure every, every family gets one. And you can put spare change, cash in these bottles and bring them back. Now, I want to say if you give a check, because last year we realized people wanted to give checks as well. You make that out to Sumner Family Church but put that in the giving envelope and mark that give back care net on that because we want to make sure we're not putting checks in these bottles. We want to catch that before we give them back because guess what? They count them for us. We don't even have to count them. So let's fill these up with a spare change, cash, or giving envelope and then bring them back. Do you want to hear this? Because this is important. February 25th, bring them back. And you can bring them right to the foyer. We'll have a basket you can put them in. And then we'll take care of it from there to make sure they get where they need to be. And guess what? Together we get to make a difference. 
in a life of a little one and families. And I love that. So thank you for just listening to that and being a part of that. And then the last thing, if you are a guest here, I just want to take a moment and say welcome. Didn't get to do that before, but we love our guests and we want you to know we're glad you're here and that you chose to worship with us today. So take a moment, fill out your green card. If you didn't get one, you can put that in the back in the black boxes in our offering boxes after the service. And then Vicki Lynn would have a gift for you as well. She's waving her hand. You don't want to miss the gift. It's good, but more than that, you get to meet Vicki Lynn, and that's, that's awesome, too. So thank you, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing what God does here, huh? <laughs> well, one thing that you're, you, you know is that uh, Sumner Family Church is a busy church, but busy with a purpose, all right? So I think it's important that we understand that, that everything that we do is really about the mission, and... Um, you know, Kim made mention of just uh, our project that we have going on, the demo that's taking place. I just want to thank um, all the guys that have been helping out with that. Guys that have been doing it daily. <laughs> guys that have been doing it daily. A group of guys that I, I believe finished up with the demo yesterday. <laughs> We're close. We're like real close. So um, just getting ready for uh, uh, the major piece of construction to happen for those new, new restrooms to go in. So exciting times. Um, again, hey, if, if you're new to Sumner Family Church, uh, it's important that you know that in all of the projects that we do, we raise money first um, to be able to fund those projects. And so we are putting in new restrooms, um, which will open up our foyer space because we'll get rid of these two and just blow it open a little bit more. And the, uh, the, the existing foyer now will move into, uh, will connect with the living room space. So, hey, we just need more room, right? More room to do ministry more effectively. And um, we just know the importance of space. And so just keep that in mind. One last thing I want to highlight. Uh, I told the men on Wednesday night, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after you. Uh, men's retreat. We have nailed down uh, our dates uh, for men's retreat. And um, I, can, I can take a minimum of 25. I can take a maximum of about 47. I'm just letting you know that, gentlemen. So there's a place for you, all right? Um, it's April 4th through the 6th. We're going to be at Lake Retreat out in Ravensdale. I got a chance to go out there and check out things this last week. Signed the dotted line yesterday, so we've got a space. And I'm excited about what the Lord will do at our men's retreat. Gentlemen, I want to encourage you to very prayerfully consider joining us for that time. There's just something about getting away, breaking free from just the monotony of life, everyday things, and getting together with a group of guys and being challenged with God's word and worshiping together. And uh, I'm just excited about what the Lord uh, might do. And um, so working on a few more details with that, I'm reaching out to a few of the guys to help out with some of the logistics with uh, everything leading up to that. It's a couple months away, April 4th, through the 6th. That's a Thursday. We'll go up Thursday evening after work. You will miss Friday work if you have to work on Friday and then Saturday. Um, so looking forward to a great time. There is a sign up out in the foyer. The sign up doesn't commit you. Okay. What the sign up does is it says, Hey, I'm interested. So you put your name and your number and I'll make sure that you get more info. All right. So um, sign up today. All right. We've already got about 12 guys that have signed up out there because I've been hitting up guys. <laughs> and I'm coming after you. I'm just letting you know, all right? So I'm trying to make eye contact. <laughs> it's going to be a great time. How many of you gentlemen went last year to our men's retreat? Come on, we, we had a great time last year out at the ocean. I know this isn't the ocean, but um, this is on a lake. All right, there you have it. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to continue uh, in our series, no matter what, this morning. And um, I'm going to be in Daniel chapter 5. So I want to just encourage you to turn into your, 
Turn in your Bibles there, Daniel chapter 5. And um, really one of the things that we, we get with this theme of no matter what is it really becomes a little bit of a, of a way of just doing life. And really as it pertains to our faith, um, we're navigating through things all the time, are we not? Challenging things in life and uh, keeping our eyes on Jesus no matter what. And, and you know what we also find in that is a little bit of God's promises. And this morning we're going to see that the God we serve is a God that does keep his promises. He does what he says and then what that does is it brings us to a place of understanding that we've got a response. What is our response going to be? Um, what is our response going to be whenever we're faced with challenging times and challenging circumstances? And um, so this morning, Daniel chapter 5, um, perhaps you've heard the phrase, the writing is on the wall. Anyone, you've heard that phrase, the writing is on the wall, perhaps towards the end of a, of a sports game, you might hear the announcer, you know, on TV or the radio say, hey, the writing is on the wall. I mean, this is as good as done, right? And uh, it, it's another way of just saying the game is over, all right? And, and where exactly did the phrase come from, the writing is on the wall? Where did, where did that come from? And what does it have to do with you? And I think it's important for us to really see that this comes from Daniel chapter 5. Because that's what we're going to focus on this morning. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, how does what happened in Daniel chapter 5 have anything to do with me? And I want you to know this morning that it has a lot to do with you. Uh, I want to take a look at a, at a picture for a moment. It's, it's a Rembrandt painting called Belshazzar's Feast. And uh, I don't know if you've seen that before, but um, uh, this pic right here, this painting, it, it, it's about a moment that the writing is on the wall where Belshazzar, <clears throat> now the, the king of Babylon, um, has an event that he's throwing, a party that he's throwing. And during that time and that moment, there is writing given to him by a finger who is written on the wall. And, and that may sound so interesting and a little weird, and it is, but here it is, once again, God getting someone's attention. And what this does is it has him terrified. And so we're going to read this account today in Scripture, and we're going to see that God wrote a message on the wall for the king of Babylon, and it is a message that is written for you and me as well. And I believe that God has a very clear word for us uh, today from Daniel chapter 5. And before we read scripture, it might be easy for us to get a little confused. And let me just take a moment to refresh our memories. Daniel was brought into Babylonian captivity as a teenager at the age of 15. And remember, he was given the name by the king of Babylon at the time, that being Nebuchadnezzar, right? Referring, Daniel refers to himself as Daniel throughout scripture, but the king called him Belshazzar. So just think belt around your waist, Belshazzar. But in chapter five, we're reading about King Belshazzar. Okay, so don't get confused between Daniel's Babylonian name uh, and the king of Babylon who is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. So both of their names have an association with Baal, a god worshipped by the Babylonian empire. And obviously Daniel did not choose that name for himself because what we see throughout the book of Daniel is that he holds on to his given name, Daniel, right? So we pick up Daniel chapter 5, this is the writing on the wall. Verse 1, King Belshazzar had a great feast for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine in their presence. And under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar gave orders to bring in gold and silver vessels 
that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple of Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, wives, and concubines could drink from them. So they brought in the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, wives, and concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised their gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And we're going to just stop here for a moment. And um, I don't know about you, but reading that, it just seems a little mind-boggling. All right? Like, whoa. Right? Like, let's pause for a moment. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm thinking you should not be doing that. Okay? Unthinkable. The Babylonians are using the vessels that God had commanded his people to use when they were back in Jerusalem to worship him. They were sacred objects. They were sacred items. And the Babylonians are throwing a party, right? Belshazzar is throwing a, 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 drunken, a drunk fest party for a thousand of his leaders, and scripture says that the king was under the influence of, as well. And so here he is. He's, he's well on his way to getting drunk. The music is raging. They bring in these objects that they took from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and they're drinking out of those objects. And so these holy and sacred objects are now used for unholy and, and unrighteous acts offering sacrifices, praising pagan gods and idols of Babylon. I don't know about you, but this just seems crazy. It seems a little chaotic. It just seems a little unthinkable. But what if I told you that we can have a tendency to do the same thing? And it's our big idea here this morning that we can have a tendency to take the sacred things of God and use them for unholy purposes. And you may be saying, whoa, wait a minute, I, I, I don't do that. But I want you to think about this for a moment. We are created in God's image, right? All of humanity. And all of us have fallen short of how we speak of people created in the image of God. Have we not? Right? So if we have ever gossiped or slandered or criticized or we've been cruel to someone, we've taken a person created in the image of God and demeaned that person. I, I want you to even think about yourself for a moment, right? Have there been times where you have spoken about yourself or those times where you are just like cruel to yourself about who God has made you to be? Like you too are created in the image of God and once again, taking the sacred and demeaning it. Let's even take it a, a little step further. How about our bodies, right? As a follower, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So God himself moves into our lives and according to scripture, when we use our bodies for unholy purposes, we are taking the sacred and what we do is we defile it and we demean it. When we offer our bodies in sexual immorality or abuse our bodies, we are taking the sacred and using the sacred for unholy purposes, right? I want you to think for a moment about Scripture. Scripture was inspired of God, breathed by God, holy and sacred. But what we come to find is that we so often fall short, right? Taking the holy and sacred Scripture, taking passages from Scripture, and maybe not always intentionally, maybe it's sometimes it's unintentionally, but twisting them out of context just to, to justify decisions that we want to make in our lives, right? Or more likely, we've taken the Scripture and, it's, and, and we unopen it or we neglect it and we neglect the sacred things of God, neglecting to do what the Scripture says, Think about what God has given you, your resources, 
uh, his provision to you. He has entrusted us with, with talents and abilities. He has even given us the gift of time. And we can take those good things, those good gifts that he gives, and, and misuse them for our own pleasure and, and our own name. And again, all of us have fallen short, just as King Belshar, Bel, Belshazzar did in the passage that we're looking at here this morning. All right, so again, we can have a tendency to take the sacred things of God and use them for unholy purposes. Now, I'm going to just like go out on a limb and say that I doubt that anybody is just kind of doing this subconsciously. I think a lot of times this happens and we're not even really thinking. And it's simply because we're not putting God in his rightful place. I think this morning's message really serves as a reminder to us about who God is and who he desires to be in our lives. And it's putting him in his rightful place. Let's continue on verse five. It says, at that moment, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and began writing. Can we just say that'd be a little weird? Writing on the plaster of the king's palace wall next to the lampstand. And as the king watched the hand that was writing, his face turned pale. His thoughts so terrified him that he soiled himself and his knees knocked together. The king shouted to bring in the mediums, the Chaldeans and the diviners. And he said to those wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this inscription and gives me its interpretation will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain around his neck and have the third highest position in the kingdom. This kind of sounds familiar, right? Like from one generation to the next of just wheels spinning, looking for answers but looking in all of the wrong places for the answers, right? The finger of a man's hand appeared and wrote the message on the wall. Okay, so whose finger is this that appears that's writing these things? What is happening here? This is a terrifying message that the king sees, but what's going on with the finger, right? So throughout scripture, the finger is used as a metaphor, the finger of God, to do so many things. For example, when God's people, Israel, were trapped in Egyptian captivity, God sent plagues that would lead to the liberation of this people from Egypt. And, and one of the plagues that we see in Exodus is the plague of gnats. And the Pharaoh's magicians came to him and let him know um, hey, Pharaoh, we can't replicate this. This is the finger of God. In Psalm chapter 8, we read that creation and the heavens are the work of his finger, that God is able to make beautiful things and create everything just with his finger, right? When the Ten Commandments are given to Moses in Exodus chapter 20, according to Scripture, they are inscribed on the tablets with the finger of God. And when Jesus walked this earth and performed miracles and he cast out demons, Jesus said, I do this work by the finger of God. And so right here in this passage today, the finger that is writing this message on the wall, scripture is clear that it is a word from God for the king and the king is absolutely terrified. And you would be too, right? We read that his knees locked together, he turned pale, and it says that he soiled himself. Yeah, just get that. There, there's a nice visual for you. <laughs> Rembrandt's painting that we just saw here a few moments ago is a very mild interpretation of this passage. If somebody had painted this passage, it would not have been a pretty painting right? At all. King Belshazzar was humiliated at his own party in front of a thousand of his leaders as they're drinking, as they are offering worship to their gods with the vessels from the temple from Jerusalem. And God would humble this king at his own party. And the king is like, I need to know what this means. And whoever can interpret this for me will be the third highest 
of position in the kingdom. Why the third highest? Let's just make a little bit of sense uh, of that. Historians tell us that Belshazzar's father is in this self-imposed exile. So he's really acting, he's the acting king. He's really the number two in the kingdom. So he really has no authority to go any lower than three, right? He's, he's the acting number two. And as the acting king, he's saying, whoever can tell me the interpretation of the words that the finger wrote on the wall, that person will be third in the kingdom, third in command. And so as you keep reading, here is what you see. Um, the queen speaks up and says to the acting king, there is really only one person who can interpret this dream. Call Daniel. It, it's kind of like reminding, hey, call Daniel to the palace. And so Daniel is, is, is brought into Babylonian captivity at the age of 15 years old. He's given a different name. He went to a Babylonian school to learn the language and culture. The king also wanted Daniel to eat his food, but at the age of 15, Daniel said, hey, king, I, I'm not eating the food from the king because I want to make it clear that I have an ultimate king, right? And, and he is the one who provides for me. Daniel, from the very beginning, had a no matter what mentality. And we fast forward all these years to chapter 5, and at this point, Daniel is much older. Most scholars believe that he is somewhere near the age of 70, but one of the things that we see is that he still has the same convictions in which he lives by. He says, I am from the city of God. I belong to God. And even though I live in Babylon under this king who is using vessels from my temple back home in Jerusalem to offer praise to the gods of Babylon, the gods that don't even exist, I am still the same Daniel. And so when Belshazzar brings Daniel to him and says, if you can interpret the dream, I will give you gold gifts. Daniel says, hey, listen, you, you can keep your gifts. You can keep your gifts. I'm going to interpret this for you, but as I didn't receive food from King Nebuchadnezzar, I am not going to receive your gifts because I have an ultimate king and he is the one who provides for me. I mean, Daniel stays a man of conviction. It's a no matter what mentality. It's a no matter what conviction. But Daniel would go on to interpret the writing that is on the wall, and we pick it up in verse 25. It says, this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene means that God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel means that you have been weighed on the balance and found deficient. Perez means that your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And then Belshazzar, it says, gave an order and they clothed Daniel in purple, placed a gold chain around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. And what we can just say like in this moment is, wow. Just like that, the Babylonian kingdom disappears. The kingdoms of this world do not last. And it is pulled away from King Belshazzar that quickly. Right? Everything that God said would happen with the writing on the wall is happening. And the Medes and the Persians take over and the Babylonian kingdom belongs to them. But the writing is on the wall. And it is on the writing, the writing on the wall, it's, it's there for us too. 
This was a message for King Belshazzar, but it is a message for each one of us. As a reminder that our days are numbered, um, that our life will be measured and weighed out, and your kingdoms will be divided. Divided from you. And so let's walk through each of these together. I want to focus on the first one here just for a moment. If you're taking notes, jot these down. We're starting with your days being numbered. And what is really fascinating about this account is that Belshazzar and each of the thousand people knew that the Persians were going to attack and lay siege on Babylon, right? They knew their time was short. They knew that their life was about to change, and yet they threw a party, a drunk fest to numb their pain and cause their minds to not think about what was going to to happen. And I want you to think about this in life today, how so many that we do life with do this, right? Many do this with their life in the same way, where I think deep down we all know that our days are numbered. We see people before us that have passed from this life, and we are well aware that this life is short. But how we prefer not to really think about that, right? Let's not think about that. Not wanting to think about it doesn't change the reality that it's true. Again, that your days are numbered. And just as Belshazzar stood before the ultimate king, the king of kings and lord of lords, God himself, you and I will one day stand before the ultimate king. And so what, what happens when you stand before the ultimate king? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 reads this way, and just as it is appointed for people to die once, after this, judgment, right? Meaning every single one of us, from King Nebuchadnezzar to King Belshazzar to you and me, our days are numbered, and we are going to stand before the ultimate king, and we will all give an account, right? Certainly this is true for all of us, but for those of us who know Christ and have embraced him as Lord and Savior and have a hope that those who have not don't, our hope is the great hope of knowing that there is life Life everlasting beyond this world as we know it. So just as your days are numbered, right? Secondly, your life is measured and it is weighed out. The writing on the wall to the king was this, that your life has been measured and weighed and it has come up short. I mean, nobody wants to hear that. Right? But I want, I want you to just think about that for a moment. I think sometimes we look at our own lives and, boy, we do a fine job of just kind of measuring and weighing out our lives, don't we? We know. God looked at a king who took sacred things and used them for unholy purposes. I mean, this was a king who fell way short of the glory of God. Not only that, his, his character and his integrity as a person fell way short of who God was. And not only is King Belshazzar's life measured, our life is measured and weighed as well. And certainly when we think about measuring our life, our lives are different than who God is. In fact, Scripture, um, when it comes to our lives, in Scripture it's often compared to a vapor. Right? We are here today and we are gone tomorrow. Or our lives are compared to the grass of the field, like chaff, like the chaff that has been blown away. We are like chaff that doesn't last. We come and we go. But the image that we get in Scripture of God, the weight of the glory of God, is that He is the rock the rock of our salvation. He is the stone. And Jesus is the ultimate stone and his kingdom lasts forever. 
Like compared to our Heavenly Father, our lives weigh next to nothing. And what we come to see is that really we've all fallen short of the glory of God and we miss, we, we so easily miss the mark on who God is. Charles Spurgeon um, from this passage in Daniel chapter 5 wrote this. He said, let man do this and every one of us must retire from this place saying, I am weighed in the balances and I am found wanting. Meaning my life has been weighed and I have not measured up. So your life is measured. It is weighed out. And then our kingdoms are divided from us. Belshazzar's kingdom and his life was taken from him that very night as we as we read in our scripture, that was the king of the largest kingdom of the world at the time. He wanted power. He wanted to rule. He wanted to keep all of the pleasures that would, would be at his hands. But what we come to see in this moment is that his kingship would not last. Everything he dreamt and built his life on was gone in an instant and all of the temporary things of the world that we build our lives on are not going to last either, right? Everything we build in this life turns out to be temporary. So we see that our days are numbered, that our life is measured and weighed, and our kingdoms will be pulled or taken from us here on this earth. And so this is the message that Daniel gave the king of Babylon. And that very night, we see how the Babylonian kingdom comes to an end. And in this moment, Daniel must be remembering back when he was pulled into Babylonian captivity. God promising, you will be here for 70 years, but I will bring you back to Israel. Right? And Daniel is seeing the promise of God come to fruition because the Persians, after in power for some time, allow for God's people to return back to Jerusalem. So Daniel has seen the writing on the wall, right? He interpreted it, seeing God keep his promise that very night. Daniel is remembering that God promised that he would keep his people, Israel, together, that they would be distinct in Babylon, and God kept that promise. Daniel is seeing all of these events unfold before his eyes and is being reminded, reminding himself, my God keeps his promises. And, and really, this is a key thought for us today, that God keeps his promises no matter what, right? And, and because, because of that, this, this is really good news for us, church, right? That God keeps his promises keeps his promises to you because the writing is on the wall for you as well. We need a God who keeps his promises because the writing is on the wall for all of us. Our days are numbered. Our lives have been measured and weighed and our kingdoms will one day be pulled from us. We are reminded no matter what, no matter what, God keeps his promises. And because Daniel is now the one who is third in charge of the kingdom. He is the one who will train all of those who will determine what is coming. He's raising up. He is mentoring those that would come after him. From the lineage of Israel comes the Messiah, right? Jesus, who enters this world for us. While Daniel was in Babylonian captivity, he, he trained wise men. He trained the magi of the day. And their lessons were passed down from generation to generation so that when Christ, years later, enters our world, they are able to look up and see the star. They are able to look up and know that the promise has been fulfilled. It says that they showed up from hundreds of miles from the east to worship the Messiah who entered this world for us. And so our, our action today simply goes like this. No matter what, I'm going to remember that the writing is on the wall. 
I'm going to remember that God keeps his promises from generation to generation. And so what it does for us today is, I, I think, it, it brings about our response. How are we going to respond to this? Like, I, I don't want that to just be a statement that, that's just on the screen for us to read. I really am hopeful that it becomes an action that we will do, that will become about how we're going to move forward. Just remembering that the writing is on the wall. Remembering that God is who he says he is, that he will do what he says he will do, and that God keeps his promises from generation to generation. Listen, I know some of you are intercessors. You intercede on behalf of family members that don't know Jesus. And so, what do you do when you don't see answers? What do you do when you've been praying for years and years and you're believing God for something, you're hoping the Lord for something in your life or around you or for a family member and, and yet there's nothing to show for it? What, what do you do? Do you stop? Do you allow yourself to fall into a place of, well, God must not be who he says he is. I'm going to just doubt or stop believing. Because I'll be honest with you, I've watched that happen with some people. So when we really take on a no matter what, way of thinking and mentality what it says to our Lord is that I'm going to trust you no matter what the outcome is I'm going to I'm going to believe that you are a sovereign God that does all things well you know better than I No matter what attitude is a, is a, is a way of, of living, it says, I'm going to remain faithful even in the hard times, the challenging times, where there seems to be no way. God makes a way. I want to just tell you today that when we live this way, it becomes good news. It becomes good news for those who believe in him and receive his forgiveness and his righteousness. And when we do, our lives are measured and not short and is not found wanting or lacking because we serve a God who is looking at us. And instead of seeing all of our sin and all of our shame, and all of our good attempts that fall short, God looks at you and sees the perfection of, of Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? The gospel message is not that you have to be enough or that you somehow have to fill the gap or figure out a way to make yourself good enough. It's just the opposite. It's coming to a place of realizing that I fall short. I have fallen short and we take those sacred things of God that are used for unholy purposes and missing the mark and we give up on relying on ourselves and believe in Jesus and what he's done for us and what we do is we come back to a place of allowing him to have his rightful place in our lives that's our response. And all of that, we see that he forgives. He makes us his son and his daughter forever. Why? Because we are children, his children. 
We are his creation. He loves us. And there is no greater love. When he looks at us, there is nothing lacking because Jesus and his forgiveness fills our whole life. And so I just think it begs the question this morning. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you said yes to believing that he is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do? And and I get that there are probably some, there may be more than some who have wrestled in this way. But I just really believe that today is a day where you will say yes to Jesus, believing that Jesus is God. He is the son who is promised that he entered this world, lived perfectly so that if you believe in him, you would not perish, but have life everlasting. And if you've not believed and trusted by giving your life to Jesus, I just simply want to invite you to do so today. Would you bow your heads with me? Like just right where you sit in this moment. I, I'm just, I'm praying right now that you would sense God's goodness. I'm praying that you would sense his great love for you. I'm praying that you would just sense in this moment a gracious, loving father who wants you to know and experience that in a way that maybe you never have before. But then maybe for some of you, it's just in a fresh way that you would sense the love and the grace and the goodness of God just right here in this very moment as we're taking time to remember. Taking time to remember that He is a God that keeps his promises. Lord, we trust you this morning. We trust you this morning. We trust that you are who you say you are, that you will do what you say you will do. And as I invite you to believe and trust by giving your life to Jesus, perhaps you would just pray with me right where you're at. In your own way, Jesus, I realize I have fallen short. I have sinned and I have missed the mark. I thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. I thank you for your goodness. And I ask for your forgiveness. I invite you to be the Lord of my life. My Savior and my Redeemer. Make me your son make me your daughter. I don't just believe about you. I choose to believe in you and become yours forever. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Another way we respond this morning by taking time to remember. Remembering that the writing is on the wall. And that God keeps his promises from generation to generation. Is just worshiping him. And we're going to take a moment to do that. And so let's worship the Lord. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to continue to just speak to our hearts where we're at. And I'll close this here in just a few moments, okay? Let's worship the Lord.
of that song are so powerful, aren't they? And, and really, 
if that song comes from a place of right here in a place of worship, that's our response. It's really putting God in his rightful place in our lives. And I, I just pray that we would do that, each one of us, beyond this room. <laughs> it's one thing to do it when we come together and we lift up the name of Jesus and we declare that in here. We're prompted to do so through the leading of our, our worship team. But when it becomes a part of who you are, it goes beyond these doors. It goes into every sphere of our lives, right? And so my prayer for you is that this would be something that we live out and we be and we do, putting God in his rightful place. Listen, if you are someone who has believed and, and trusted and given your life to Jesus today, I think a, a, a proper response really is to share that with someone. Just looking at somebody that's close to you and just saying, hey, I, I've said yes to Jesus today. I, I am allowing him to have his rightful place in my life. And, and if that's something you're choosing for yourself, I want to just encourage you would, you, would you share that with us? Because I, I really think that just being able to help people in the, the next steps of what that looks like is so important. Listen, you'll find a green card in front of you, a yellow card, or yellow. Um, I am not colorblind, that's green. You'll, you'll find a green card in front of you. It's our hello card. And there's a place on there where you can just check that you said yes to Jesus. And if you just put your name and your number on there or an email, I, I would love to reach out to you and connect with you. Because I, I definitely think that we all need just people to come alongside us, do life with us, and help us navigate this journey of what it looks like to give our lives to Christ. So take a moment and just fill that out. You can put it in one of the black boxes on the, on the back wall there, and uh, that will just help us to be able to connect with you. If you're a guest here today, um, please fill that out so that we can connect with you as well. And and with that church, um, may the Lord bless you and, and be with you as you leave this place today, as we are declaring that we are living our lives for him, putting him in his rightful place. So may the Lord bless you and be with you as you leave Sumner Family Church today and uh, just continue in an attitude of a heart of worship and fellowship and may the Lord bless you. All right. God bless you.